thank you, Brooke, and thanks for to everyone else who is on this um, um, phone call or Zoom call attending. Uh, this is about sensors, edge computing, IoT, or what some people call the intelligence of things. Um, we're going to go through trend overview uh, and look at this from the standpoint of H1 or Horizon 2, Horizon 3 trends. Um, then we'll do a technology overview, looking at types and costs of sensors. Then we'll talk about why it matters, and then we'll show a bunch of specific examples of how uh, how these sensor and IoT products are are rolling out. So, back in 1966, the the Star Trek show showed this thing called a tricorder. It was really a handheld multifunction device with sensors to scan the environment collect data and run data and analytics. Now, you know, 30 years later, it became a reality in the health field. And now you're seeing it with Apple putting an electrocardiogram into like a watch, um, mobile monitoring systems for patients, blood pressure, oxygen, heart rate, et cetera, are conveniently available today. Um, but it started as science fiction. And, um, now, what, you're, what we're seeing in 2019 is anywhere from 14 to 20 different sensors being built into iPhones. You can see the sensors in your phone by downloading this app right here, the Sensors Toolbox. These sensors are creating tons of data, and as of now, 2020, you can see that there's, there are dozens of zettabytes of data being, pro, being uh, created, but they're not being processed are harnessed right now. They're not even being stored, and they call that uh, transient data. But what will happen is these IoT devices uh, start emerging, and as AI uh, processors go into products, we will see that tons of data will be processed in real time, and that processing will create decision making and responses coming from the products in real time to help consumers or you know people, medical professionals, et cetera react to the data. Sensors have been produced since, you know, like 1992 when touch screens came out, you know, cameras started coming out in phones around 2002, but it was really, they became really good in more in the 2007 range. G GPS was integrated into phones in 2006. Fingerprint sensors came out in 2011. Humidity and temperature centers came out in 2013. And, there, and more and more sensors keep coming. And right now, there are a lot of academic papers being written on adding low-cost materials to sensors, like using paper and plastics, uh, replacing silicon. Uh, and, and we're going to start seeing those products emerge soon. All of this is playing into the emergence of 5G, the, the ability to access AI in products. Uh, augmented reality and venture or um, um, uh, VR uh, coming to life, blockchain being more important, the, the advent of uh, voice machines, a lot of IoT. In 2023, uh, we believe at Iterate that all of these technologies will intertwine. They'll all be $100 billion plus, uh, uh, markets, not just the R&D aspect of it, but the consumer uh, aspect of each of these technologies, and they will merge together. And a lot of it's due to these sensors that we're seeing. Uh, one of the platforms Iterate has uh, that we haven't really released publicly yet is this ability to monitor what's going on in a bunch of different trend areas. And right now we can see over a thousand companies producing and inventing in the sensors space that's right here. And the head count has grown dramatically over the past uh, past uh, decade or so. Um, in addition, there, there are over a million patents filed uh, since the year 2000 on sensors, which are, with the majority of them happening since the year 2010. Um, and these are being filed to enable a lot of different categories. If you looked at each of these boxes, they represent uh, industries where sensors and IoT devices are expected to have a major impact, and those include stuff like agriculture companies, automotive companies, hardware and software platforms, drones and robotics, healthcare companies, fitness companies, retailers, uh, utility and energy companies, uh, smart watches, security, home, home products. Um, and if you even look 
it, we look down into companies too, and if you even look at the way Sephora, a beauty retailer, is talking about sensors, there's a, they're in the news a lot around these types of things. So uh, sensors related that, that uh, relate to coronavirus, uh, Sephora talks about that. Sensors that help with the beauty routine, sensors that help them in stores, uh, sensors that help them get more personal with their customers, and, and sensors around AI uh, being used to help with skincare. Many, many sensors, even with you know, a beauty company like Sephora. So let's look at a technology overview and what types of sensors are out there. Um, Tesla has tons of sensors, but some of them are cameras, eight of them. Eight of them in the current, or the uh, Tesla from a year ago, three forward-looking cameras, two side-looking, two side-mount rear-look cameras, and one rear camera. Then they have 12 ultrasonic sensors in the car too, as well as a front radar. Uh, on top of that, a lot of other cars come with the GPS sensors, microphone sensors, pressure sensors, exhaust, sensor, or exhaust gas sensors, and fuel sensors. Uh, then we already talked about smartphones, but back in 2019, you know, this is the type of sensors that your phone would have in them, proximity sensors, ambient light sensors, CMO uh, image sensors, GPS sensors, accelerometers, microphones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you break it down, looking at a, an Apple Watch, and I won't read all of these, you could, if you want this presentation later, you can get this and look at them, but there's the accelerator, the gyroscope, the, magno the mag magnet magnetometer, uh, the barometric pressure sensor, ambient temperature sensor, um, heart rate monitor, oximetry sensor, skin conductance sensor, skin temperature sensor, GPS. And, and what's happening now is uh, there are companies coming out that are able to make these sensors work without even a, a, a power source like a battery. Um, so this is a company called Williot. It's, it's uh, founded in 2017. It's raised $89 million. Amazon is one of their investors. And its sensors, which are these little tags that they're, they're like paper, um, harvest their energy from Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, you know, and sources that are unrelated to batteries. Um, the, Amazon and, and Williot believe that you could uh, – use these tags to make your clothing connected. And, and it's possible that you'll even be able to use it in the grocery industry. Um, then you have companies, little startups making uh, advancements on for things like watch, watches that are strap on or add on advices. And Aura is one of those that, we, that showed at CES a year ago. Um, in addition to that, there are body sensors coming out like pills and, and scanners for airports and, and some of these are graphene based. So this is a graphene based on the left, a graphene based electronic platform combined with CRISPR. And um, it, it, it basically, um, uh, it, it's, um, well, it, 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 it takes the, you know, it works at a DNA, uh, RNA type level and, um, uh, you know, it, it'll create great advancements for the uh, medical field. Uh, cities are also using a lot of sensors now. And, you know, they're everything from the uh, accelerometer and proximity center sensors to gas sensors, smoke sensors, motion detectors. They're, they're being put into uh, buildings and roadways, uh, traffic lights, and more. Um, if you go into an Amazon store, uh, one of their automated stores uh, like Amazon Go, there are more than 3,000 cameras and sensors inside there are 120 uh, camera uh, unknown devices uh, at the top of the store. We don't know what those are right now. There's six more unknown devices at the top of the store that look like this one right here above the number six. There are um, 100, 200 cameras uh, that have circled in red uh, that are pointing in different directions from the top of the store. And there are over 2,000 cameras put into shelves in the stores. This is a small format store too. Uh, I think it was about a 2,500 square foot format. And now they're, they're experimenting with a 12,000 square foot format, which is like the size of a, a Trader's Joe, Trader Joe. Uh, and this is, this is an example of that, but you just scan into the store. If you haven't been there, you just scan in with your phone. And this here says that they've now opened their full size cashierless grocery store. That was done about a year ago, I believe. 
Um, also, you can take traditional cameras now. Uh, Iterate's actually done this, and we were able to process feeds through, uh, through traditional cameras by running them through AI algorithms, uh, either on the edge, like in a store, or in the, in the cloud uh, to identify uh, people and differentiate them from devices. Um, these are some of the cameras that Amazon owns. They own a clown cam, a blink cam, the ring uh, real-time camera. Uh, by the way, the blink also has voice capabilities, as does their cloud cam. Uh, they have the deep lens, which they open sourced uh, so that AI developers from around the world uh, could contribute to their uh, AI algorithms to try to make, make their AI, the Amazon AI algorithms better. Um, they have the Go lens that we just looked at. Those are AI plus centrifusion, meaning uh, all the cameras uh, work together, all the sensors work together to stitch all their feeds into one feed so that they can make better decisions in the store. They have the Body Lab, which is an AI computer vision uh, product. They bought that from a startup, uh, and it does body modeling. Uh, then they have the Look and the Echo Show. Um, AI cameras now are being used to be able to detect emotion. Uh, so not only do they know this is a person, they can know what feelings a person have. And you'll see there's even, it even goes beyond this, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, sens sensors can be used to, um, to analyze olfactory data for fragrance applications. So uh, imagine uh, having, you know, your phone or, or another similar type device be able to uh, actually uh, smell like a nose and, and even smell better. This is an Israeli startup called Nanosent. It's developing a technology that uses interactions between the sensor and the chem chemical substances emitted from our bodies to generate a distinct, distinct pattern or fingerprint for each scent. And it uses the data to train its algorithm to identify different kinds of smells. Um, this is a thermal sensor that um, doesn't look at the person's face, but actually can look at the heat or the thermal uh, energy coming from a body to determine uh, uh, whether or not they're scared, disgusted, sad, uh, shameful, uh, or if they're envious about something. And so you could combine this through the fusion technologies with the facial recognition to probably even be uh, more accurate. These are IoT devices that Amazon owns. They're, this is actually an old picture, they're more now, uh, but there are dozens uh, of IoT devices that Amazon owns and sells to consumers or uses in their stores and elsewhere to, to collect data and process that data. And, um, and what they are building through this is what uh, we like to call a complex system. It's it's based you know complex based on complexity theory, where it's where there's a lot of nonlinear activity, and uh, di and distributed networks gathering data to create uh, recommendation systems. So sensors and their interfaces. It is believed that by the year um, 2022, going into 2023 edge computing will be uh, mainstreaming. And 40% of company cloud deployments will include edge computing. And what that means is that instead of processing data on the cloud or a central system, the data will be processed in consumer products or in like medical products uh, in a hospital or you know, in a, a product that's used in a warehouse in a, in a, um, uh, at a retailer. And 25% uh, of those endpoint devices will actually execute AI algorithms in the product itself. And, uh, and the reason this is happening is because now we're starting to see chips come out that are this small. Um, this is one from a, co a company called Sentient, and uh, that actually processes AI. And, um, and I'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute. This is a picture of that same chip sitting on a penny, but I, we were able to put 54 of them on a penny here. And again, they, these will fit into almost any consumer product. These do need a source of energy right now, but it's a very low energy consuming product, even when it's processing AI. And what's going to happen as a result of this is consumer products are going to start getting brains and memories. 
and um, you know they will make decisions or they will recommend decisions without even sending data to the cloud. Meaning that all the privacy and, and security that you you know that you would have as an individual person would remain with the products you own. They don't even have to go back to Amazon or Google or someone like that to process the data. Now, for AI to work, it has to be trained. And uh, AI training is also changing a lot. Um, so back two and a half years ago, actually three years ago or so now, back in October 2017, um, it, it, took, well, uh, it took 10 days to uh, process, uh, I, it really to identify images. And uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this was an experiment done with a thousand different kinds of objects. Um, it took 10 days to train the AI to, to recognize those images. It was actually 10 days, three hours and 59 minutes, 59 seconds. That same process now, back in May 2019, so uh, almost two years ago now, could be done in two minutes and 43 seconds. So it's just the, the advances in AI training have uh, gone at a speed similar to even the, the decrease in the size of the chips needed to run things. So, these things combined have allowed computing to move from the cloud to the edge cloud. An edge cloud is a, a cloud run by someone like uh, Verizon, one of the telecoms where it's, it's close to a consumer, but it's not at the consumer. It may be a few miles away from the consumer versus going to a centralized location like back at the Amazon cloud. But where we're headed is to on-device cloud computing, where the sensing, processing, uh, storage of the data is done on the device, and what that's going to have is implications around privacy. There are going to be a lot of blockchain advancements that take place around this type of data uh, analysis and storage. And we're going to also see the emergence of the personal data economy as a result of this, where consumers, we believe consumers, will start taking control of their identities. Um, this is from Deloitte. They believe that the AI, the edge AI chip industry is poised for a lot of growth over the next uh, four years. And you can see that uh, this is just looking at a consumer business, not the enterprise business. But uh, right now, this year, there, or last year, they, they uh, saw that uh, there would be 500 million units of uh, smartphones that would have AI uh, chips embedded in them. They they think that that'll double by 2024, and you know we'll see an explosion of uh, wearables and and um, and uh, speaker type products hitting the market. Uh, the interesting thing though is Deloitte did a uh, an analysis of this back in 2017, and their analysis, their look forward projections for 2020, were only half right. In other words, the market expanded at double the rate that what Deloitte thought it would be back in 2017. And who knows, that might happen again just based on how, how fast everything's moving. Um, you can see that there are at least 45 startups working on chipsets with purpose that are purpose built for AI. Um, at least five of them have raised more than $100 million. Um, it's a big market, which is why a lot of companies are going after it. And you see this this dotted line in the middle, um, those are start, mostly startups that are focusing on chips that operate at the edge. And Sentient is one of those, that's that really tiny chip we just showed you uh, before. So computing at the edge, which is what, call, what you know, we call edge computing, it's, it's hitting the market now. Uh, the world is expected to create 163 zettabytes of data annually by 2025. That's 10 times more than in 2016. Um, also, uh, IDC did this research. IDC believes that a quarter of that data will be created in real time, and IoT devices will be contributing 95% of that volume. And, and they'll be processed by little tiny chips like that you see on the penny. Uh, the process, the, so there'll be these tiny AI chips that require tiny power, or in the case of Willie, it really uh, power that's harvested off uh, Wi-Fi uh, or, or other types of non-battery oriented energy supplies. So the processing and storing of massive volumes of data uh, uh, in a centralized cloud is impractical. More decisions will move closer to the sensors, to the video cameras, the cash registers, 
the hygrometers and, and hundreds of other devices that create the data. In addition, uh, wireless will happen at wire speed. And a lot of this is ha gonna happen because of uh, the emergence of 5G. It'll allow for a lot more distributed intelligence. It, it'll become feasible through because of 5G. So again, these are these clashing or the convergence of all these different uh, technologies happening at once. AI, uh, uh, the, the decrease in the size of the chips and, and the, the emergence of uh, technologies like 5G. So what are the costs of these sensors and data storage? Uh, there's a, a decreasing cost of sensors. If you just go back to 2004, the average sensor cost about $1.30. Uh, by 2020, it was down to 38 cents, that same uh, sensor. Uh, you can see that uh, the, 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 if you read about sensors, you'll read a lot about MEMS. It's microelectromechanical systems. That's what MEMS means. It's a technology that in its most general form can be defined as the miniaturized mechanical and le electrical mechanical elements that are made that are made using techniques of microfabrication. So these are sensors that go into things like smartphones. And you can see that the cost of all these different things like accelerometers, microphones, they're all, they've all dropped significantly. So the, the cheapest cost of an AI chip right now appears to be about a dollar. Um, but we went and found other research. This is from Deloitte that says that the current phone that Samsung has just come out with that has AI processing capabilities in the phone, not at the edge, not at the telco edge, or not, at, not in the cloud, you know, on Amazon, but in the phone itself is about $3.50. Um, Apple, they think, is about $5.10 in Huawei out of uh, China, they think their AI processing chip is about at $1.42. Now that interacts with a processor inside the phone that's already processing what we already know is in a, a, a smartphone, and that is all the graphics, you know, what you see on the screens, the camera sensors, and uh, other, other actions. So all of these processing units combined are about 20 times more expensive than the AI chip alone, but the AI portion itself is anywhere from a dollar fifty up to about five dollars, it appears. Um, so what the white says is that after adding in all the manufacturing costs, uh, this means that the MPUs, that means neural processing unit, that's an AI chip, a neural processing unit, and their attendant benefits, which mean a better camera, offline voice assistant, and so on, can be can be put into an, a US uh, smartphone that costs two hundred and fifty dollars or less with less than a one percent price increase. So you can just imagine uh, this is going to proliferate, um, you know, through through the markets. Storage has also come down in costs uh, um, because of open source uh, um, uh, advancements and uh, cloud computing and enhancements. And, and it used to cost back in the year 1995 about $10,000 to store a gig of data. By 2014, that was down to three cents a gig, and that's continued to drop. So as a result, you know, all the, again, everything can converge. One, one tech advancement enhances another tech advancement. And these, these capabilities that used to be independent are starting to merge together. I want to talk briefly about uh, Innovation Horizons. Um, I think it was McKinsey that started using this. I can't remember. But there's the Horizon 1, Horizon 2, and Horizon 3 um, method of looking at innovation. Horizon 3 involves a lot of unknowns, and those are where the imagination is uh, taking place. It's, it's where academic papers are written and, and researchers in university labs are conducting experiments. And these are being done today around things like graphene. It's where the cloud used to live a long time ago. And, and, uh, but then, the, and, and in those cases, there are no business models formed yet. But the technology does exist. It may be very expensive, but they're trying to figure out how to bring costs down. When it moves to Horizon 2, there begin some no-ones start coming into the equation, and they become partial no-ones. Uh, business models start to form. It appears as if startups will strengthen and, and start emerging. Yet no uh, company has yet uh, developed great traction, even though deployments are occurring. This is where a lot of exploration is happening. There'll be a lot of failure still, 
But when it hits H1, that's when there are a lot of no one knowns. The businesses are taking off, startups are taking off, uh, full scale deployments are happening by large companies, or one startup has got significant momentum within a space, and consumers are starting to adopt beyond those very early adopters that, that operate in the H2 space. Um, so what happens is we're moving from instinctual moves to uh, data-based moves, basically, as you move across the horizons. Um, you can also look at it in this way. Uh, on the left end uh, of this, you have a lot of uncertainty, and on the right end, you have a lot of certainty. And if you think about this from the standpoint of sensors, what's certain today is that the cost of sensors are decreasing and continue to decrease. The sizes of sen sensors are decreasing or shrinking uh, in magnitudes. They're gathering more and more data, and big data is becoming more and more storable. storable. Uh, the costs are reasonable, and, um, and there, there are a lot of product adoptions happening there. What is still uncertain, but will become certain, is that uh, AI is emerging and making the sensor data more useful. The usefulness of this is still emerging. Um, but, there, but there are improving contexts coming into products. There's the systems and products are starting to learn. Um, the, system, the products are starting to anticipate needs and react to those based on the AI that's able to be built into products. Um, products are, are coming out that will begin to predict your situation with high levels of accuracy. Um, products uh, will be modified automatically with algorithms kind of on the fly. Um, so you'll be able to uh, provide services off products, kind of like Tesla does with their cars today, where you can do updates through the, through the air. Um, and, and anyway, things that will happen um, beyond the automated customization and stuff like that will be that you can sign into your homes, sign into your car, sign into your office. Everything might require a sign-in eventually. And now you have companies like Amazon, the, the kind of newer companies that don't operate based on the quarterly earnings announcements that really look at everything from the long haul. And if you just look at, and so they invent with that in mind. They don't, they think in uh, what's, what they say is seven year time horizons, not three year, not two year, but seven year time horizons. And so they operate with a lot of patience. And this is an example of patience in action. Um, a, an engineer at Amazon had the idea of offering Amazon Prime uh, to members their loyalty program today. That was down back in February, February 2nd, 2005. They thought it was a good idea and they launched it. And it took a long time for it to get traction. In fact, it didn't really hit an inflection point for at least seven years. They just kept iterating and iterating on it. And, and, and then it obviously we all know today that it took off, but companies that operate with this kind of patience will benefit from a lot of these new technologies. Um, Walmart has sort of taken notice of this, and we're reading a lot about it. You can see that they, as of about 20, the year 2016, started filing for patents. Prior to this, retailers didn't really file for any patents that we could find, and uh, and, it, and Amazon though had been doing it, you know, since the year uh, 2000, or even before that, with the one-click shopping and that, which was one of their first patents. Um, Amazon has filed for at least 21,000 patents today. Google's done 128,000, and Walmart has done 3,800. And we went and looked in our platform, in our signals platform, and iterated what kind of patents uh, Walmart is filing for today. And it just so happens that a number of them seem to be around sensors. Uh, so I'm going to highlight uh, four of them here. One of them is systems and methods for automated person detection and notification. This is done by Walmart Apollo, which is their patent holding uh, company. Systems and methods for managing self-checkout services, that will require sensors. Uh, the third one that we highlighted, system and method for reconciling RFID read locations. The fourth one there, method and apparatus pertaining to module-based scanning of RFID tags. So they're doing a lot around the sensors and technology space today. And because of all this action in the startup community and in the enterprise community with Walmart and Amazon and Google, um, we're going to continue to see a lot of really unique ideas emerge, um, and the cost could come down dramatically because of the size and cost uh, improvements with all of the sensors and the AI processing, et cetera. So this is a motion sensor that was out about a year ago that's 
you know, fourteen dollars and ninety nine cents that you could put put in your home. It's called Kangaroo. Here's a video based vital sign monitor from Bana.ai. Uh, they use video to scan your face, and then they can do stuff like tell you your heart rate, your heart rate variability, your mental stress, your oxygen saturation, your respiration, your blood pressure, all coming through just looking at your face through a smartphone. And this, that was the picture I just took on the left was from about a year ago. This is what their homepage looks like today. It's pretty cool if you go look at it. But what they say is they've got, uh, you know, uh, vital signs for monitoring everyone everywhere. It's done in real time and it's medical grade vital size measurements uh, using only your smartphone, laptop or tablet ID. Just look at the camera's device and in less than a minute, they'll give you all your vitals. Uh, but imagine Amazon taking uh, control of this too and just using the Echo to be able to do the exact same thing. And you can imagine they've got, we know right now that Amazon has over 10,000 people working in AI, uh, a lot of them in Boston, a lot of them in Seattle, a lot of them down in uh, San Francisco. And uh, you can imagine because of their focus on wellness that they're working on these kind of things. Uh, this is a micro moat. Uh, it's the smallest autonomous computer uh, as of a year ago. And you can see it next to a grain of rice uh, it can be packed with sensors and function as a single computer, or they can work together to operate as a, as a swarm of computers to monitor an environment or, or events. So our, one of our, our recommendations is just to keep your eye on converging tech advancements uh, because convergence opens doors that didn't exist before. And I think a great example of this is Kodak. Kodak was the inventor of the first digital camera back in the late 90s at the time, uh, or even before that, at the time uh, they had a $30 billion market cap, um, uh, Kodak did. But they ignored that invention that was done by a, a 20, I don't know, he was like a 25 year old uh, engineer that worked at Kodak, they just ignored him. Uh, but what they failed to realize is that this uh, broadband was gonna get better. Uh, phones could converge with things like camera. And, and because they failed to look at these industries that operated outside of a traditional camera market or traditional film market, they just totally lost sight of what might be coming down the pike. And as a result, you know, the $30 billion company became uh, worthless in, in about the year uh, 2009, 2009. So here's a, an example of convergence. Uh, AI, big data, and blockchain will converge uh, because of sensors and because of 5G to become a real powerful market. And this is, this is all these things are needed to create a really powerful IoT smart device market. Um, because of IoT and because of all this AI, uh, people, we believe people will begin taking control of their personal data. And this is going to affect the way, affect loyalty programs for retailers and it'll affect uh, healthcare pretty dramatically. Uh, but consumers will say, my data is my data. It's not Amazon's. It's not L'Oreal's. Uh, it's mine. And so we're seeing open source uh, technologies come out. Here's one um, that is, it provides an infrastructure for what they call the global personal data economy. It allows for safe, consensual, and compliant storage, sharing, and trading of personal data between organizations that hold it and, and between the consumers who produce it and the organizations who seek to use that data. So what we think will occur, and it'll be done a lot through the provisioning of blockchain technologies, is that um, uh, businesses, consumers, and marketers, their worlds will all change pretty dramatically in the next four or five years. Um, Here's some use cases now, uh, a real world experiments as to why consumers will care about all these IoT advancements that rely on, on the combination of sensors, uh, AI, and edge computing. First one, cleanliness, and I put this in here because uh, today uh, the COVID, you know, the coronavirus, the pandemic is affecting all of us. So uh, IoT can help reduce the spread of virus and uh, also add to uh, security opportunities. If you go to the Apple uh, campus in Cupertino today, they have this uh, at all the doors, and it's basically um, uh, it, it's an, a gesture, gestural sensor. If you wave your hands at the pole, the doors automatically open. They also have um, th 
this uh, a patent that Apple uh, applied for and was issued has facial recognition built into, um, you know, they, they could put it into their, uh, onto their Macs. And uh, the facial recognition can ID you and use sensors to unlock your computer or open up a door. Um, there are recovery opportunities for, uh, that, that could uh, be important. So these are healthcare recovery type things. This is a sensor here, and in this proof of concept, a Michigan research team, University of Michigan, embedded two strain gauges in the sensor, which can pull apart like a slinky. So you can see this on this woman's, the sensor on this woman's uh, shoulder. One was placed at the corner of the soldier, shoulder uh, to record the raising and lowering of the arm, and the other went into the back of the shoulder to, to gauge cross-body movement. The team believes that these sensors can be used in a physical therapy regimen so that patients can track their progress and ensure, they're, and ensure they're completing the exercises correctly. Evke, which is the researcher, also thinks the new sensors could help athletes improve their form. Um, so these kind of sensors could start coming on the market uh, to help people with recovery and training. In the healthcare world, um, there are a lot of different <clears throat> things happening. So there are scanners for people uh, that can look for fever by just scanning people with uh, a, a visual scanner. It wouldn't even need to touch a person or be put in front of a person's forehead to determine if someone's got a fever. Um, <clears throat> this is a company called Owlet that puts a heart rate monitor and oxygen level monitor into a baby's stocking. You can see this on the baby's foot. And you can see that this particular uh, sock has 1,332 ratings on it. And they're pretty high ratings, a 4.5. <clears throat> this was as of a year ago. This helps a, a mother or father uh, just be, feel a lot better about uh, that their baby is breathing well and et cetera. Um, same thing is being used for pets. This is, <clears throat> this is a company called Whistle. I think that uh, Mars, uh, the, the candy and pet food company bought this, uh, this company a little while ago, Whistle. And down on the bottom, it says, Whistle Fit collects and shares over 50 samples of your pet's movement every second, enabling the research team to look for hidden insights and discover never before patterns. Um, they wanna be on the cutting edge, they say. If, as we discover new links between pet behavior and health, health will update Whistle Fit to give you new capabilities and features offering even greater insights into your pet's well-being. So what's happening in the human world is also helping in, happening in the animal world. <clears throat> These are, uh, as we all know, I think by now, uh, Apple Watch is building ECG capabilities into the watch so they can monitor a lot of activities around your heart. And here's another example of a, a watch type device that will do even more types of uh, 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 monitoring of different types of health uh, screens that a person would normally get at the doctor. Um, Apple, uh, you know, and other watch companies are able to monitor menstrual cycles for women, um, you know, when she's having her period using the watch alone. That's what you see here on the bottom right hand corner. Uh, a four period day, is, you know, that's, that's, uh, and, and it can also monitor mineral levels. So they're monitoring you all day long. Um, all of this, you know, these sensors that are in these phones, the accelerometers, the gyroscopes, the magnetometer, the light sensors, GPS can be combined with call logs, SMS patterns, application usage. The data can be collected and trained, uh, tested, and then it can be classified into various types of um, uh, areas like fall detection, sleep monitoring, joint health monitoring, et cetera. And again, just one little device like a watch can do all this. Uh, underwear can do the same thing. So here's another experiment by a company called Skin. The same type of monitoring can be put into a woman's uh, sports bra and it could be put into a man's uh, uh, briefs. There are also new types of scanners coming out. Here's one that can measure the uh, quality of your belly fat and then give you recommendations on how to improve that. This one I think is called Belly. Uh, this is a stick like a, a woman would use to see if she's pregnant. Uh, if you urinate on it, 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 you, it and, and collected a sample of your urine, 
um, you can then be able to you, uh, apply an AI and it'll uh, actually give you recommendations on how to improve your diet. Um, then there are digital thermometers out there today. And if this were to proliferate across the country in a, a, a greater sample, you know, we could get a, a national sample. You could start seeing uh, early detection of COVID and COVID hotspots or flu hotspots around the United States. So again, all the, the information can be pushed into a centralized reporting uh, center uh, for, for doctors and the government to see. Um, toilet seats are even do, uh, coming out where you can monitor pressure, uh, motion sensors, urinalysis strips, uh, stool cameras, uh, rear end cameras, <laughs> uh, Euroflow cameras, and, and then all that data can be fed out to the cloud. So this might be useful in a hospital and who knows about a person's house, but just another example of an experiment. A uh, lot more implants are being put into people. Uh, deep brain neurostimulators being looked at, the gastric stimulator, foot drop implant, insulin pump, cardiac defibrillator, cochlear implant for the ears. Um, and all that data can be collected and moved into a user interface that a consumer can own from a phone to a PC. Uh, it could also be sent out to the cloud or, or a, you know, a larger computing area where uh, that can be accessed by people that you provision, whether it's an emergency room or your physician. Um, the information flows out from you and the assessments flow back and they could come from people like doctors or come from an AI that's even held on your phone or on a device like a watch, you know, to give recommendations on what you should do in the future. Here's a biodegradable sensor that monitors press, like uh, pressure uh, and then it disappears inside your body. And this one is to monitor chronic lung disease, brain swelling, and other medical conditions before dissolving safely in the consumer's body. Pills are coming out too. Um, these are smart pills, pills that tell your doctor when you've, you've taken them and how much exercise you're getting. Um, <clears throat> we've already looked at this, the thermal sensors. Then there are uh, sensors coming out that help with mobility and um, uh, they create nerve connectivity. Uh, they help. They can help with walking and hearing. Uh, so here's a cochlear implant that doesn't have to sit outside your ear. It actually can go inside your ear, um, and it consists of a tiny sensors that detects and and uh, the ossicles that vibrations and an actuator that helps drive the stapes uh, and, and helps you hear again without any without having to have a hearing aid outside of your ear. Uh, this is another example of it here. They think it'll be really important for uh, the invisible hearing aid will help with playing sports, with sleep comfort, with uh, reducing social stigma, et cetera. <clears throat> this is the, one of the most fascinating ones. This guy sitting down on the right, he actually lost his legs in a climbing accident. He, he became a, a professor at MIT uh, after he had that problem. And, um, and he started building uh, uh, prosthetics that will actually connect to your nerves so that your brain can tell your body, tell your prosthetic how to move. And it goes all the way down into the foot and the toes. And here he's, uh, I, I actually helped one of my friends, uh, his son lost a leg in a car accident. And uh, he, he was, I think the 50th or so person uh, to get fitted for one of these types of prosthetics legs that that uh, goes, um, that connects to your, your nerves. And if you get a chance, go look at this Hugh Herr TED Talk. Uh, he shows you how his legs operate on the TED Talk. It's, a, it's the beginning of the bionic U. There are 24 sensors that are, that are in those legs that connect into your nerves. Safety is another area that will be enhanced through sensors. Uh, this is an invention by uh, Iterates uh, Mike Frizzini. Our, our, our chief of, um, of data science and our, our uh, evaluation cloud. When he was getting his, uh, his um, master's degree in data science from Berkeley, he and a couple guys built this. It's a real-time fall detection device. Um, it uses state-of-the-art deep learning. And all the inference is done on the edge. There's no sensitive data transferred to the cloud. Um, so again, just another type of device that can use sensors to make people's lives better. 
Um, it can also be used, sensors can also be used for knowledge uh, to reduce misinformation, to save money, and to improve the memory of historical data like fitness. Um, this is an example of a, a way that product packaging is now uh, being able to integrate with cell phones and, and eventually maybe even into glasses that people wear uh, so that they get more information about the products they're buying. So by integrating a thin film electronics into the packaging, so it's a steel foil chip, I, uh, companies will be able to monitor and con communicate storage conditions, temperatures, uh, expiration dates, product information, product authentication. So those are all company benefits, but the consumer can benefit too because they can interact with the product by scanning it with their smartphone or uh, in the future, it might even be a, a voice activation, but they'll be able to like a product that they're looking at, you know, by like the like button from Facebook. They'll be able to get rewards uh, this way. They'll be able to launch uh, product information into their phones. It might be a video that they get into their phone by just scanning it or a video into glasses that they're wearing that teaches a person about the product they're looking at. You could have treasure hunts. You could share with your friends all through this type of interaction with a product. Uh, we're seeing that five, four, the four big GAFA companies are all coming out with the new, with new glasses in the next two to three years. These are echo frames. They're already out there, but, but I don't think they're even close to doing what they're going to do soon. They do say it's like wearing echo on your face, but, but it's going to get a lot more advanced here pretty, pretty fast as 5G comes out. And as, as AI chips get smaller and you can process the data in the glasses themselves. So Facebook has said they're going to launch their own glasses in 2023. Apple is trying to get it done in 2023 as well. Uh, it is a priority project for uh, Apple. <clears throat> and here's one of the reasons it's kind of interesting. Imagine a non-invasive non wearable peripheral neural interface that allows humans to converse in natural language with machines, AI assistants, services, and other people without using their voice, without opening their mouth, without externally observable movements, simply by articulating your words internally. In other words, thinking and activating a, a, bone, a bone conduction device that might be stored inside your, uh, your eyeglasses. Uh, uh, human computer interaction that is subjectively experienced is completely internal to the human user, like speaking to oneself. Imagine being able to think into your glasses and order products in your glasses, in a, let's say in a grocery store as you're looking at a shelf of products and telling someone like Amazon to just ship it to your home or, or tell me, telling Amazon that you want to see the reviews of the certain product that you're looking at in a store and then thinking, just send it to my home and that that creates the order. This, this is where a part of where we think we're headed with stuff like glasses. But there are sensors, there are sensors being built into barbells, uh, spin bikes like the, like the Peloton today, rowing machines, sneakers, yoga pants. <clears throat> it's also going into beauty products. Uh, um, L'Oreal's been experimenting with these sensors that you can put on people's fingernails. Um, and and uh, the nail decal relays UV data, you know, sun data, uh, so that consumers know more about how to interact with sunscreens. Uh, this particular one is battery free. Um, then there are other uh, products coming out now that adapt to you. So you take a picture of your face, um, it gathers data from the outside also, like pollution and weather, then formulates a lipstick or a, a makeup regimen just for you, based on where you live and what your, your you know, the conditions of your face. Touchless payments are also done with, uh, with um, sensors. Um, this company here vouched one, this is one that Iterate uh, really likes. And what they have is this uh, advanced multi-factor facial recognition and liveness evaluation. So they're able to observe motion and perspective and confirm based on the motion that it's a real user, but not only that it's a real user, that you know, that it's Brooke who introduced us to this program today, or that it's me. Uh, they know who we are. So there's a movement evaluation. And then there's also facial matching. And you put all these together and you can get, you can actually ID a person at a very high uh, rate of um, accuracy. Uh, Iterate, uh, a company I work with, uh, we, we built a touchless uh, checkout. 
uh, at a, for a gas pump. We did it with a, a large company, um, but it's it basically allows you to drive into the gas station. It uh, then identifies your your car using uh, you, you know knows what kind of car you're driving, um, the color of your car, the the license plate, and then can match up the use the owner of that. Uh, vehicle uh, and activates the payment system on the phone. You never have to take your credit card out. We built that whole thing in, in three weeks and, and it all operates on the edge. All the processing is done not at the cloud, not at Amazon, not at Google, but in the gas station. Simplicity is also uh, going to become uh, more democratic, uh, uh, help, help consumers interact easier with, uh, with technical interfaces. So uh, this is a smart lock uh, that Walmart actually invested in. They raised, this company raised $71 million. It's a Bluetooth-enabled level lock um, announced in October, so a little in 2019. Uh, it it uh, allows you to be able to take control of your lock with voice commands via Siri or Google, uh, you know, and, and you can even interact with it from your watch or your phone. Um, voice People love voice. If you go look at the Echo, the reviews of Echo on Google, you'll see that it, the last time I looked at it, it had a 4.8 rating, and you hardly see any products that have a rating that high. And this is a, a really interesting comment here. It says, I've only been using Echo for about a month, but I've already enjoyed the benefits of owning it. I'm 66 and marginally tech savvy. I'm going to just flip through the rest of these real fast. We're uh, at, at the end. Uh, but and I, I think you've got enough of a feeling of what um, we're looking at here and how sensors and edge computing will change the world, you know, from drones to all these cameras, uh, to facial recognition in cities, uh, using NFC uh, induction to uh, unlock doors <laughs> without batteries, facial recognition, uh, using using IoT to conserve water. Uh, and all these sensors and edge computing to do that as well. Uh, so, you know, that's why we believe people should care. Uh, the newest companies out there today, like Amazon, are building ecosystems. They aren't vertically, you know, they don't serve vertical markets. They serve uh, broad markets, and really the connecting tissue is sensors and AI and a lot of what will soon be 5G connectivity, which is a whole other topic. It's really, really interesting. Um, but but know that the competition of the future will be these platforms that are actually way more than platforms. They're big ecosystems that are leveraging the newest types of business models that are coming out, which are uh, include things like network orchestration, which we we love to talk about, or and AI enablement. And and, um, and Amazon is a a great example of you know really the leading company probably making that happen. So product companies with a few services need to become service companies that offer products. Uh, this is the new reality because products will have dollar, you know, to $5 brains that collect data and think and interact with your digital self. Uh, so our recommendation going forward is to monitor all this convergent, include AI and sensors in your strategic planning, and determine which of the products and services you sell uh, should be sens sensorized, and AI enabled. Uh, thank you. Any, Brooke, are there any questions we uh, thank need you, to John. answer? <laughs> yeah, so everyone, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to be launching a poll right now. Please let us know your thoughts. And also, please submit any questions that you have. Um, I know we're, we're right at time. But if you have any questions, let us know. And we'll, we'll answer a few right now. Um, and any that we don't get to, we can answer later. So yeah, please let us know your thoughts. Um, So, um, John, you do have a question. How will software be added to the chips? Um, I don't know how, I mean, I, just in all honesty, I don't know how that is programmed in. That would be a question for like all the developers that work at, at uh, Iterate, uh, Brian, uh, John S., uh, if any of them are here, I, you know, you should chime in. Uh, Dave, if you want to chime in, if you know, that would be great. But I do know that the software is there. It's uh, all, a lot of the processing uh, happens on the edge, and that's because the software 
the decision-making software is sitting uh, on those chips at the edge. Perry, I don't uh, know the exact how. Yeah, yeah Perry, this is Go Dave ahead. Jenkins. Uh, I work with John, and as you probably know, most AI works on many nodes working with uh, many other nodes. And then it just kind of, that's what the training process is, is those nodes are all trying to find the most efficient path amongst them. And so that is something that you can actually put on the chip because each node is essentially, you know, a, a bank of transistors or interact, you know, actual physical interactions like that. The software to manage all that can at a machine language level be on the chip, but most likely it's around the chip. Uh, so a lot of times when we're talking about these AI chips, we're just talking about very efficient um, infrastructures that allow AI to be done very quickly at a low power, uh, high efficiency rate, rather than trying to cram it through the same chip that has to power your PC or, you know, a hundred other myriad uses. You can actually design the chip to be specific for this many node to many node interaction that is at the core of AI training. Yeah, just uh, thank you, Dave. Dave. Dave was the CTO of Backcountry, which um, which was bootstrapped through open source software and ultimately sold to Liberty Media for about $150 million. He's both technical and a marketing guy. Unlike me, I'm more non-technical, but we do have, all of our engineers, which are uh, a lot of them are formally trained in AI and have advanced degrees in AI up to the PhD level. Uh, they, they understand how to uh, do this. And if you want more information on that, we'd be happy to uh, connect you to them, you know, if you need more than what Dave just explained. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, also to follow that up, Mike Frizzini uh, jumped in and just said a lot of the software is embedded as well. So hopefully that answers, answers the question. Um, we have a few more. Um, how will this affect the retail apparel world? You know, I think this goes back to the H1, H2, H3 thing. Um, we don't know. Like, a lot of this is still in an experimental phase. But, you know, it could be that, um, um, you know, uh, uh, chips or sensors like that Willia uh, sensor that we saw in the very beginning, the one that took the, the Amazon investment, gets, in, gets put in clothing so or on clothing so that you know that it's uh, – Authentic. It could be uh, dis describing where it's made, so there's no child labor involved. It could provide aging information. Uh, it, you know, a lot of sustainability type information could be on the, uh, you know, uh, allowed to process through to the consumer. Um, it could be that the the retailer itself uses a lot of information for supply chain purposes. But I think that's the thing. A lot of experiments are happening at this point. Uh, Amazon is, in my view, they're the ultimate experimenter. Um, and I'm sure they've got a lot of different um, uh, attempts to do different things underway. That's why they invest in companies like Willia, uh, is to gather that information. So who knows? Awesome. Thanks, John. We, we have another one. What does this mean? Uh, what does this edge computing mean for the environment? Oh, <laughs> uh, Dave or Mike, do you want to handle that one as far? And I, I guess the question around that is around uh, how much energy consumption will it take? I, I do know this, like a lot of the, the energy consumption is going down, 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 like, like Willie is trying to do. They're trying to use, uh, use um, uh, wireless activity to power the chip and all that wireless uh, activity is already happening in the air. And uh, that little tiny, that little minuscule chip that we, we saw that was sitting on the finger, that too has an extremely low um, need to, process, to, to use uh, power to, to allow it to activate. Uh, Dave or Mike, yeah, do you want to? I, I would yeah. say that reduced power consumption or more efficiency power consumption is essential to that. The other big thing here is more efficient supply chains. Uh, if factories don't have to use 20 pounds of plastic to make a product, but can only use six, then that's a huge environmental impact right there. If, if 
products can be recycled and that's anywhere from metals to plastics to wood to anything that makes the supply chain and the back end of the supply chain more efficient all would have a more positive uh, environmental impact. Yeah, and you know, the, the other, uh, yeah, and related to that too, is just if you think about, um, yeah, just being able to be a lot smarter uh, consumer of products and, 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 you know, reducing waste through real-time uh, analysis of product usage, that, that should be a benefit to the environment. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, there's going to be a lot of debate around that. I do know that the cloud itself uh, the cloud computing centers like that Amazon, Facebook, Apple operate, they do create a lot of um, uh, energy consumption. Thank you. Thanks, John. And uh, Mike also jumped in on this one, just said low power and efficient computing on the edge for sure. Environmental impacts can be measured more broadly with edge computing and sensors as well. Um, so thank you everyone for the answers to that question. So we have two more questions. Um, would we like to kind of go ahead and finish? Yeah. Them? Great. Ask them and as long as people are here, we'll continue answering. Perfect. Um, so one question is this chip, it's open source to use any software? So ask that one again, Brooke. Um, so are the chips open source to use any, oh. are they open any software? Uh, a lot of the, a lot of these chip providers have leveraged open source SDKs. Uh, some others have their own in-house SDKs. Again, it it kind of depends on the chip provider. You know, AMD, Intel, ARM, they've all got different approaches on that. Some, most of them will have an open source SDK equivalent, just to again to open things up. But then they will also prefer their own in-house SDK. Awesome. Um, all right, one more. Um, what do you see our AI slash edge computing slash IoT uses for sports at the professional level? IoT for sports at the professional level? Yes. Oh man, like, I mean, if you think of every product, I went to baseball because of you, Brooke, in my head. <laughs> Brooke's husband is a professional baseball player. Uh, it, you know, the bats, I'm sure, are easy to, you know, you'd be able to put a lot of sensors in those to maybe see, they, they could measure things like um, speed of the bat or the arc that the bat is being swung at, or, you know, and you might even be able to marry those up with sensors that are put in the balls so you can see, you know, the convergence of the data coming off both those. I'm sure um, uh, if you think about the, the uh, rehab type uh, shoulder sensor that we saw, uh, earlier in this deck, uh, those types of um, products will probably be used to help people um, um, heal faster. A lot of athletes heal faster. And if you think about football and the head injuries and the, you know, I'm sure that there'll be ways to start detecting issues uh, like the, 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 how hard a hit is or or maybe even afterwards, like what's happening with the brain, uh, like immediately afterwards, that, that could probably be done on the sideline. I think for professional sports, there are just tons of potential um, uh, applications. Uh, Dave? Yes, my wife is a physical therapist and she actually does gauge range of motion on joints, exactly like that stretch uh, device that you were showing. And so, I think the first things we'll see this is definitely in the physical therapy world and in the training world and just in the biometric feedback to allow, again, baseball players to improve their swing because every little millimeter and every, every ounce of speed counts. So those would be the biggest areas. Yeah. Right. A very, very cool area. Um, my husband has gotten to play around with even some VR um, where he can hit off of any pitcher in the league. Um, so he's, he's definitely enjoyed that just, uh, it's a pretty cool feature. So Mike jumped in and said, uh, it's perfect for boundary and line judges with quote unquote smart lines in sports from football to tennis. I think we've all seen the example of the tennis ball uh, in slow motion hitting right at the edge of the line. And Solomon, um, yeah. Ray, who is one of our engineers, jumped in and said, sensors are being used for analytics and sports performance. For example, there is startup tracking uh, basketball player three throw, free throw forms. Um, so 
yeah, that there, I think it's a limitless. Um, area. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's, it's just like that retail question. It's like the world is, there'll be tons of experiments happening across lots of applications. I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah. that wraps up our questions for today and thank you everyone so, so much for jump, joining in on our event. Um, we will be sharing this link so you can go back and reference it. Um, we really appreciate it and we hope to see you next time. Thank you, Brooke. Bye everybody.